Hello, and welcome to Bridge Online. My name's Paul. And I'm Bethany, and we're so glad that you're here today. We would love to know where you're tuning in from right now, so why don't you let us know in the chat? And if this is your first time joining us, or you've been with us for a while, we're so glad that you're tuning in. The Bridge is, is a church that exists to be with Jesus and become like Him for the sake of the world, and that's exactly what we're gonna do today. So as we dive into a time in God's Word together, we pray that this blesses you and that it allows all of us to abide with and be transformed by Jesus both today and every day. And if it's your first time tuning in, we are so excited that you're here. If you could do just one thing, drop a waving emoji in the chat right now. One of our online hosts would love to reach out and say hi. And if this isn't your first time, will you help me welcome everyone with a big bridge welcome? We know that we do this together. So after you do that, go ahead and share the stream with a family member or friends. You never know who might need to hear today's message. So as we enter into a time of worship, I wanna take a moment to encourage you wherever you find yourself right now, whether that's your bedroom, your dorm room, your living room, or your office, take a moment to allow this to be a sanctuary where you can be with Jesus. Set aside any distractions, get a copy of God's Word ready, maybe grab a notebook and a pen so that you can take notes as you follow along. Yeah. Remember, we're not doing this alone. So at any point, if something encourages you, you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat so we can do this journey together. And on that note, let's dive into God's Word together.
we praise you for your faithfulness. I thank you for every single testimony that is in this room right now. We give you praise for the ways that you have worked in and through us, God. Come on, let's keep singing. Thank you for the stories in this room. Thank you for the lives you turned around. Thank you for the miracles we've seen and the ones you do Come on, can we sing that again? Thank you for the stories in this room Thank you for the lives you turn Thank you for the miracles we see and the ones you do This is our testimony, you write a better story, just look around this room, what can our God not do? This is our testimony, you write a better story, and I am living proof, there's nothing God can do. Yeah. Come on, we sit. Thank you for the way that you say Every captive here that you've set free For all the prison doors you're opening God, we are running out yeah. Oh, we say This is our testimony You write a story just look around this room what can our god not do this is our testimony you write a better story and i am living proof there's nothing god can do i see you bringing us back to a place of surrender all eyes are on you what can our god not do i see your people on fire we're laying our lives down all eyes are on you what can our god not do i see you bringing revival we're flooding the altars all eyes are on
praise to Him we say, You are worthy. church. The beauty of that song is that it reminds us that we get to glorify the risen lamb of God, the God who left the grave empty, the God who loves you, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Church, let's give God some praise this morning. that you decided to join us today. We here at The Bridge like to make everyone feel welcome. So whether it's your first time here, or maybe you've been here for the last 20 years, why don't you turn to someone on your left and on your right, introduce yourself and let them know that you're happy you're here, then you can have a seat. today, huh? I wish it was like this every day. I could do with more of it. Uh, welcome to the bridge. We are so glad that you're here. You joined us on a special day. Today is Child Dedication Sunday here at the bridge across all of our services. We have 29 kids getting dedicated, which is super awesome. Here are some of them now. In Luke chapter 2 in the Gospels, we see Joseph and Mary bringing Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to be dedicated. And the passage says that when they did that, they brought him there to be in the presence of the Lord, to give him to the Lord. And so uh, we want to draft behind Joseph and Mary in this long tradition that we have amongst God's people to dedicate the littlest ones in our midst. Joseph and Mary would have been very familiar with a passage in the Old Testament from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 called the Shema. Very famous passage, and it goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them down on the, uh, uh, on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So this is what we are about. We dedicate kids here at the bridge for two reasons. One is to give parents an opportunity to put a stake in the ground to say, I am here to cultivate my character and my home in a way that honors God. The second is that we as a community come around these families and we say, uh, you can't do it alone. We're going to come alongside of you and work and pray with you and for you for the sake of these kids. So... With that said, here is who we have up on stage for this service. We've got the George family dedicating Beckett, the Gillespie family dedicating Haley, the Jury family dedicating Renly, the Cunningham family dedicating Kaylee, the Dennison family dedicating Kinsley, the Tate family dedicating Abel, the Holtz family dedicating Rosie and Ophelia, the Nichols family dedicating Elena and Austin, and the Underwood family dedicating Elsie and Ginny. That's who's up here. So today is a, a commitment both on the parts of the parents and for us here as a church family. So let me begin with you parents. Do you parents here today commit yourselves to raising your child or your children in a home that puts Jesus at the center? providing them with opportunities for growth and nurture and dedicating yourselves as examples in apprenticing Jesus. If you do, say, we do. It's great. All right, church families, this is for you. Do you promise today to help these families to raise their children 
to follow Jesus? Do you promise to love and challenge them to keep the commitments they are making today to be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world? If you do, say we do. Great. I want to pray for these families now. And as we do, uh, I would encourage you, if you're comfortable, to extend a hand towards them in solidarity. And as we pray now, uh, if you would, take an opportunity to maybe select one or two of these families and say, I'm not just going to pray for them today. I'm going to pray for them in the days to come as well. Let's go ahead and pray together. God, thank you so much for these families and these children, and we thank you for the gift of children. When you give us a name to call you, you tell us to call you Father. So we thank you that you are the image of perfect parenthood after which we model ourselves. Uh, thank you, Jesus, that you love children, that you welcome them to yourself, and that you say that the littlest among us have honor and dignity and value, and so we welcome them too. We believe and stand by these commitments we're making today, Jesus, but we know that we cannot uphold these commitments in and of our own power. They're just too big for us. And so we pray, Spirit, that you would empower us to be faithful to the promises and commitments we're making to each other and to these children today. Help us to live out these commitments, not just for the sake of the kids, not just for the sake of our church, but for the sake of a watching world so that they can see your grace and your power and your glory at work among us. We love you. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Hey, would you join me in celebrating these families one more time as they take their seats? You guys are good. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Well, hey, thank you so much for gathering to worship. Uh, we want to say that every single person who walks through these doors, or if you are tuning in online, you've got a next step in your journey with Jesus that God is calling you to. And so we want to help come alongside you and take whatever step that might be. And so if you would like to begin a conversation about taking a step like that here at the bridge, simply pull out your phone right now and go to bridge.tv slash next. You'll see our connect card there. Let us know a little bit about you and then what steps you're interested in taking. And one of our staff will be uh, following up with you sometime this week. And if you are joining us for the very first time, first of all, I want to say welcome. We are so glad that you're here. We've been praying for you, and it's good to finally meet you. If you are interested in beginning a conversation about getting more involved with the bridge or just want to learn more, your next step is something we call Open House, which is our intro class, and it tells you all about the history of the bridge and where we're coming from and where we're going, about our ministries, allow you a chance to meet our staff and ask questions. And this happens every single month with the first part kicking off on the first Sunday of every month during the 4 p.m. service. And so if you'd like to RSVP for the next session, we'd love to help you with that. Simply check that open house box on the Connect card and we will save you a seat. Every single Sunday we gather, we love to carve out time to give back to God. We believe that when we give, several things happen. First of all, it's an act of saying thank you to God for his generosity to us. Second, we believe it forms us to be more like Jesus, who is the most generous person to ever live. And we actually believe that when we give, that God uses our gifts to truly change the world. So if you'd like to give today, you can give in the black buckets as they pass down the row in just a moment, or you can give online at bridge.tv slash give. I want to say thank you for your generosity, church. And as we prepare to dive into God's word now, uh, we have a series called Every Table that we've got going, and we put together a video that tees up today's sermon. So take a look.
morning, Bridge fam. How are we today? So good. So All right. Yeah, I'll shoot, man. Good to see you all. Uh, before I go any further, a very special welcome. If you're joining us online, Murray County Jail, Columbia, Perry County Jail. Can we please welcome everyone who's joining us everywhere, wherever they're at. We love you guys so much. And uh, before, we, before we dive in, I want to I share something cool that happened last Sunday uh, after our 530 service. We had kind of a holy moment after our 530 service, and uh, Pastor Stone wrote something up, and I want to share uh, some of that with all of you. Uh, so after we gave the benediction last Sunday, after the 530, our worship team continued to play as everyone exited the auditorium, as we have many times before. Um, but what happened next was different. The presence of God just began to overwhelm the musicians in the room, which turned into a, uh, a half hour of just sort of spontaneous worship. And those of us who were there uh, know how just special that was. And we're unsure of why God chose to move in that way. In fact, as he did, uh, people in the lobby heard it and like made their way back into the room uh, to see what it was that God was doing. And for the next several weeks, what we're going to do as a church is to continue to make extra space uh, for God to move like that. So after our 10 a.m. service in Columbia and after our 5.30 p.m. service here in Spring Hill, we're going to have an extended time of worship following the benediction. Now, a couple of quick notes. Here's what that isn't. What this isn't is an effort to recreate a moment that happened last Sunday, or is it an attempt to manufacture a move of God? What it is, is a response to God's kindness to us and a hunger for more of his presence and an opportunity to experience God in a new or a different way. And so if you're at all interested, uh, you're invited. We're calling it an experiment because we don't really know exactly how God will use it, if he will use it, but we just want to be obedient to where it is that we sense that God is stirring and leading. And uh, man, I'm just so, so grateful to be a part of this church and what God is doing here. So uh, thank you all for being such an amazing community and family. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 20. If you want to turn or swipe there right now, you can. And uh, before we do, uh, like we do every Sunday, a simple prayer posture before we dive into the word. A posture that says, uh, I'm going to let go of what I need to let go of, and I'm here to receive, God, what it is you have for me to receive. And uh, wherever you're at, if you're comfortable, I'd love to invite you to this. I'll pray for us, and then we'll dive in. God, thank you for your presence. That's ultimately what we need. That's what we long for, God. Would you help us to let go of whatever maybe we've been clinging to today, this week, maybe this year, this decade, so that we can receive from you, God? Holy Spirit, would you do a work in us and through us that only you can do? We thank you, God, and we love you. And we pray all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. I, want you to, uh, I want you to think about a keepsake that you have that's really meaningful to you. It could be something maybe a parent gave you or a grandparent. It could be a, a friend or a sibling. What's something that's maybe been passed on to you that like holds deep meaning or significance when you see it? Uh, I have a couple that would kind of fit that category, but what I thought of when I was thinking about a keepsake was, uh, was actually this. This is a 20-inch uh, rock ride symbol from Zildjian. It was my father's symbol. In fact, this was the symbol at the drum set that I learned to play drums on. My, my dad uh, loved drums, and he, he loved a lot of drummers. And if I were to ask you who the best drummer was, you might be inclined to say John Bonham or Stuart Copeland. But the correct answer, of course, is Keith Moon from The Who. Anyone with me on that one? And so, three of us, great. I, um, but this was the drum set that sat in our basement that I learned to play drums myself. It's how I discovered music and a whole community of people that became very, very important to me. But it all started with this, this big, loud, I don't, I don't even play this symbol anymore just because I don't really even love the way it sounds. But when I, when I look at this symbol, I think of my father. And it doesn't just simply have symbolic value. That's the, that's the correct response. Groans, confusion. What are we doing in this church? I, uh, I totally get it. But it's interesting, though, now, because it, I don't even just think of my father. I also think of my, my own kids. In fact, my, my kids have really taken a liking to the drums. Uh, in particular, my youngest son. Here's a quick clip of him uh, in our garage showing you what he's got. It is so metal. I don't even know. <laughs> but keepsakes are valuable because they embody what they represent. 
which is a little crazy to think about it because to anyone else, that's just like an old symbol, right? And maybe you have something that would fit in a similar category. Like to anybody else, that's just like an old jar or a beat up glove or like a clearly unopened Nickelback CD. Like I'm, I, my guess is you probably have something that the rest of the world might look at and go, I don't, I don't really see all the significance, but it has significance because of the person that gave it to you. Because something was passed on and it has deep meaning and significance for you. And I think the Bible actually speaks to this uh, a fair amount. In fact, one of my favorite Proverbs, Proverbs 13, 22 says this, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. And I don't think he's just talking about things. I think he's talking about something that we're going to talk about today, and that's the word legacy. I want us to kind of sit with this question. What kind of legacy do you want to leave? And here's the goal. I want us to see that, like, it's not an optional thing. Uh, everyone is leaving a legacy. The question is, do you know what it is? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? How do we live a life on purpose? Not for our sake, but for the sake of the world. I believe that how we answer that question, regardless of your life stage or journey or where you're at spiritually, physically, relationally, I believe that how we answer that question has m massive implications for our life. In fact, the parents that were just on this stage and in Columbia are keenly aware of this idea, right? New parents tend to feel the full weight and reality that they are leaving a legacy that is both equal parts inspiring but also terrifying. I'm, I'm entrusted with this child. How, how do I keep from screwing this up? New parents in particular tend to really feel the weight and gravity of this, but leaving a legacy is not just for new parents, it's for all of us. In fact, that's part of why we do that communally together as a family. We all just agreed to walk with these families through the highs and the lows. What kind of legacy do we want to leave? That's how God has built this. So what kind of legacy do we want to leave for the people coming after us? For most of us, myself included, we don't tend to live like hyper aware that like every day we're building some kind of legacy. And I think it's important that we make a distinction between reputation and legacy. Here's, here's how I would... Uh, define the difference. A reputation is who people think you are. A legacy is who you actually are. A reputation is what you have when you arrive, when you show up on the scene somewhere. A legacy is what you leave when you go. A reputation is made in a moment, but a legacy is built in a lifetime. I want you to, I want you to really think about that. What, what am I building with my life? What is the legacy that I want to leave? Uh, I think political commentator Robert Reich put it brilliantly. He said, the central paradox of our time is that most of us are earning more money and living better in material terms than our parents did a quarter century ago. Yet by most measures, we're working longer and more frantically than before, and the time and energy left for our non-working lives are evaporating. The new economy we are living in brings enormous benefits in terms of wealth, innovation, new chances and choices, but our absorption in keeping up with it all is leading to the erosion of our families, the fragmenting of our communities, and the challenge of keeping our own integrity intact. We are in danger of losing the crucial distinction between making a living and making a life. Does that resonate with anyone else this morning? It certainly does to me. I, I can get just as caught up in like the newest thing or the, the newest approach or the newest strategy or a platform or likes or friends or network or net worth, but I don't wanna simply make a living, I want to make a life. And more importantly, a legacy that will outlive me. I love the way that philosopher William James put it. It says, the great use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. My guess is that most of us, even if you're not a Jesus person, you're not sure how you feel about this whole church Bible thing, my guess is that most of us deep down agree with that. This has to be bigger than just like me and my 90 years here on planet Earth. There has to be, I, I know deep down that something, I want to give my life to something bigger than just me. So amidst the noise and appointments and challenges, here's, here's where I'd love to begin today. The challenge is don't, don't live to be a legend, live to leave a legacy. Don't live to try and like be something important or build some kind of brand or our own little kingdom. Live to leave a legacy. One person who is, I think, deeply aware of the importance of leaving a legacy was a man named the Apostle Paul. He spent a ton of time investing in the lives of others so that his impact would outlive his life. So I want us to begin here in Acts chapter 20. In uh, verse 17, it says, From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of that church. Now, 
Ephesus was this like great strategically placed city. It was the hub of commerce and transportation. It was a pretty ideal place for Paul to kind of base his ministry. Chapter 19, you can read about it, all these different stories of what happened there. And it's calculated that Paul spent something like three years total at Ephesus. And for Paul, that's a lot of time. So he's, he's, he's talking about a community of people that he like knows well, that know him well. And what comes next in Acts 20 is kind of like his farewell address. He's under the assumption that he's never going to see these people again. And so he's thinking about legacy, thinking about this community, these people that he has invested in, poured his life out for. It contains what he wants them to remember about him, their legacy, and what they should do in his absence. This is also, by the way, the last recorded speech made by Paul as a free man. By the time of his next recorded speech and for the rest of his life, he will be a prisoner. And Paul has a sense of this, by the way, which we'll read in a second. He has a sense that things are about to shift dramatically for him. So the question is, what does Paul want the Ephesian elders to know as he leaves them for the last time? What is the legacy that he wants to instill on them? Verse 18 says, when they arrived, when the elders arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. Publicly and from house to house. It's this, this balance of like temples and tables. This is the rhythm that we see in the first century church. It says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So even in the, in the face of great opposition... Paul is saying here that he declared the whole truth of God. Whether preaching publicly or sharing at tables, he declared the whole truth of God. Whether addressing Jews or Gentiles, he addressed the whole truth of God. To not shrink back from declaring the whole of the gospel. This, I think, has massive implications for us today. Because there are parts of the gospel that are easy for us to want to kind of avoid. We don't love words like, Sin or repentance, metanoia, changing directions. But Paul is saying, don't, don't shrink back from the like, lesser popular parts of it. This is why I think when we, see in, when we testify in court, we have to say something like, we agree to tell the truth, the whole truth, and what? If, if that's the case in our legal system, how much more so should it be when, when it comes to our lives and the gospel to proclaim the fullness of the gospel? Then in verse 22, he says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Now, that phrase, compelled by the Spirit, could also be translated bound in the Spirit. In fact, if you're reading a different translation, other English translations use phrases like in obedience to the Spirit, drawn irresistibly by the Spirit, and even one as a captive to the Spirit. I I think... That one verse exposes one of the great shortcomings of followers of Jesus in the modern era. We often live our lives not compelled by the Spirit, but picking and choosing when we want to be led by Him. For a lot of us, it's a lot less that He is the divine director of our lives and more as a consultant to whom we turn to when we need a little bit of advice. It's, it's easy to kind of keep the Holy Spirit as like an option when we're like in a jam or we hit a fork in the road. But Paul does not seem to have that relationship with the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm, I'm captive by, I'm compelled by, irresistibly drawn by. What if we actually lived like this and didn't just simply listen to sermons about it? Like every moment of every day, comp- what if we began our days? That's part of what we mean when we sit at any table and pray, Lord, at this table as, in, as it is in heaven is a way of saying, I don't actually know what this other person needs, God, but you do, compelled by, driven by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul lived his life compelled by the Spirit. And I think it was because of that, he was able to fully trust God's plan. When we live like that, we can, we can live in trusting that, man, God knows what he's doing in every circumstance, in every conversation. Paul has a sense of what's in store for him, but that was all right because he knew that his future ultimately was in God's hands. God had been faithful in the past, and he was trusting that God would be faithful in the future. He could allow his life to be compelled by the Spirit. Verse 23. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. How many of you would love to get that memo? 
you're praying to God for clarity, direction, to be compelled. He's like, I can't tell you a whole lot, but here's what I can tell you. <laughs> Prison, you're like, okay. And the good part, hardships. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> Can I try again? Is there, a, is there a third coming that I'm not aware of? This, this is the clarity that he has, that prison and hardships are facing him. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So as Paul addresses these Ephesian elders, he let them know that the Holy Spirit had made it known to him that he would soon face imprisonment and hardships. Yet he did not turn back. He did not call an audible. Compelled by the Spirit, he continued on. With eyes focused on Jesus, he could face whatever hardships came his way. And I think that is just as true today. The Gospels do not offer us some sort of walk in the park life. I saw a meme recently that said, Parenthood is a walk in a park. It's Jurassic Park, but a park nonetheless. Like it's. <laughs> So some of us were handed a version of Christianity. It's like, just pray this prayer, and then everything just sort of becomes breezy. Paul says, I know, I know that there's difficulty facing me, and yet I'm compelled by the Spirit. He has one goal, finish the work to which he's been called. He would write something similar, actually, a few years later while in prison at Rome, much closer to his death, to a young apprentice named Timothy. This is what we read in verse uh, 6 of chapter 4 in 2 Timothy. It says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race, I have kept the faith. So Paul here is also again thinking about legacy. And he's thinking about this young apprentice that he has spent time investing in. This is sort of Paul's last will and testament to a man that he has sort of served as a spiritual father for. And he's trying to summarize, he's trying to make sure he gets all the important stuff out on the table. Can you imagine having to do that in a letter? If you knew that your end was near, someone you've been walking with, investing in, you're like, how do I, how do I fit all of this into one letter? This is basically what he's doing to sum up a life of being on mission in, with Jesus in just a few sentences. That's what he's doing. He's thinking about his legacy and wants to make sure that Timothy carries it on. And with that in mind, how, how does Paul view himself? I mean, Paul, the great, the great missionary of the New Testament. I think the key is in verse 6. He says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. I love that at the end of his life, a pretty illustrious life, to be honest, the way that Paul talks about himself is being poured out for the sake of others. I heard a pastor years ago, he says, listen, you're not responsible for filling anyone else's cup up. You are responsible for pouring out yours. Paul's like, man, as I near my end, poured out, not for my sake, but for the sake of others. He sees this pouring out as a way of giving himself to something beyond himself, something bigger than himself. And as Paul's death draws near, he knows that the mission could ultimately cost him his life. And not like in a metaphoric sense, by the way. Bringing the gospel to as many people as he possibly could will ultimately lead him to his death. That's what he means by pouring himself out. So let me just pause and ask, do we feel the same way about our legacy? About pouring ourselves out? Or is it, is it more about like, well, I want to be remembered well. I want to like build a, a platform or a kingdom or net worth or whatever it is. I don't think any of those things are bad in and of themselves. But do we see it as a pouring of ourselves out? What would it look like for us to pour ourselves out when it came to our time and our gifts and our resources and our tables? Lord, I, I want to live poured out. I had a, a, a professor in college, my undergrad, and he was nearing retirement. And he was sharing with us how frustrated he was with, with like his peers who were also nearing retirement and how they were all making these endless plans to go on as many cruises as they possibly could, sort of just kind of eat, drink, and be merry. And then he would get in our face every semester and he would say, I want to die with my boots on. And it's like a, like a young 19, 20-year-old, like that was like so compelling to me. He's like, I'm not, I'm not looking to kind of just cruise off into the sun. I want to die with my boots on. I want to live a life poured out. Paul also saw his life as existing for the sake of others. Verse 7 says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now it's easy, at least for me, like when I, when I uh, initially read that verse, it feels a little braggadocious, doesn't it? It's a little, it's a little like, here's how I've crushed it so far. Here's how I'm killing it. And even though he's using like athletic terminology here, 
I don't think he's painting a picture of himself standing on top of the podium like holding the gold medal. For Paul, it wasn't about finishing the race. It wasn't about winning the race. It was about finishing it. He doesn't say anything there about winning the race or crushing his enemies or like being better than anyone else. He's saying it's ultimately about finishing the race. If you want to leave a a legacy, you have to finish the race. He never says anything about winning. He says stay the course. And staying the course has everything to do with faithfulness. Many of you are here because someone else was faithful in their life. They ran the race. They passed on to you not a symbol or a knickknack but the gospel of grace, and it's what led you to this moment here. Think about it. Have you ever had a situation in your life where you wanted to quit but didn't? Maybe it was a job that wasn't going your way or a relationship wasn't panning out how you hoped. Maybe it was a goal that you set for yourself that just seemed too difficult. It is in those moments that faithfulness is forged. When we face difficulty, when we feel like throwing in the towel, When we get to the end of our lives, we'll most certainly look back and recall a lot of challenging times where we could have thrown in the towel, but we have to finish the race. That's the legacy that Paul is building here. He's saying to Timothy, be someone who can look back at your life and know that you are faithful. So back to Acts 20. Up until this point, Paul has shared with the Ephesian elders three things that he hoped they would remember. One, that he had declared the whole truth of God, not skirting around the parts that are difficult. Two, that he lived his life constrained or compelled by the Holy Spirit. And three, that he'd been willing to endure hardships for Christ. Next, he sort of shifts slightly and addresses the elders with some imperative statements. I want you to pay attention to this starting in verse 25. He says, now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, in light of that, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your Guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. So he utilizes this language of like, like shepherding, a shepherd and a flock. And Paul exhorts the elders to care for their congregation, their flock. And I don't think this applies, by the way, just to like church leaders. I think this is a charge for all of us. Paul wants them to remember how he cared for the flock and exhorts them to do the same. And he warns them about false teachers. And this is not an old problem, by the way. He says, even from among you will arise false teachers, false prophets. There will be people and ideologies that claim to be Christian and even at the surface look Christian, but are dangerous teachings. I had a mentor that used to say, uh, it's always good to ask, is this biblically sound or just sound biblical? Is it biblically sound or does it just kind of have like a Jesus-y vibe to it? And you're like, yeah, I guess that sounds kind of like Jesus. Is it biblically sound or just sound biblical? Now notice what he says here. He says they do it, quote, to draw away disciples after them. False teachers always want a following. They always want a crowd. And talent can draw a crowd, but only God can build his church. Paul says, watch out. Like be on guard. Don't, Don't be asleep at the wheel. And then we have one final reminder from Paul, verse 32. Now I commit you to God, to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He reminds them of the words of Jesus. It is, it is better to give than receive. Now, if you were to like flip through the Gospels and try and find where Jesus said that, you, you won't find it there. It's actually not recorded in any of the four Gospels. But apparently it was so known among the disciples that this was something Jesus said. And I, I think we could agree it fits, right? It feels in line with the kinds of things Jesus teaches. But he declares here and elsewhere that his motivation in ministry was never getting. It wasn't like... 
building a, a stockpile of, of resources. It wasn't about him getting rich. It wasn't about him getting but giving. He wasn't about getting rich off of people, but making others rich, spiritually rich through Jesus. It wasn't about a platform or possessions or fame. And so up to this point, he's now given uh, five aspects of his legacy to the Ephesian elders. One, that he declared the whole truth of God. Two, he lived a life compelled by the Holy Spirit. Three, he's willing to endure hardships. Four, he cared for the flock. And five, he believed to his core, it's actually better to give than to receive. And I think you could summarize all five of those with one word, that he lived a legacy of service, of pouring himself out, of living for the sake of others. It's in this address to the elders that he exhorts them then to follow his example. Parents, you know this especially well, but I think we all can understand the concept. Um, children in particular will follow our example way more than our advice. Has anyone found that to be true? Some of us are offering advice to people who did not ask for it. <laughs> That's a different sermon for a different day. People, especially those that we are investing in, we are apprenticing, that we're pouring into, they are way more likely to follow our example than whatever pithy truisms we send their way. Which sometimes, I'll be honest, is really haunting. My, my kids are now at the age where they're telling everybody what Papa says at home, right? <laughs> the kind of music he listens to or like the way how he actually drives and how yellow doesn't mean slow down but speed up. Like that kind of, you know what I mean? Like that's... Our children and the next generation will way more follow our example than our advice. So after he uh, delivers this address, there's one more part. He kind of wraps up here in verse 36. It says, when Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. So this passage really uniquely ends not with like confetti cannons, but with tears. In fact, in verse 19 and 31, he's already referred to tears multiple times. Tears, I would argue, are a part of living on mission. If, if we're going to be serious about bringing the gospel to every table, I mean, there's going to be moments of celebration, but some of us know this all too well. There will also be moments of grief. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. That's, that's my prayer for all of us. And Jesus left a legacy of service. Paul followed his example and left a legacy for us to follow. But it might not require that we set sail for distant lands the way that Paul did. It might, in fact, actually start at home, at our table. Take a look. If you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead... Who would you choose? Kylie Minogue. Oh. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. Oh, God, I wouldn't have a clue. I know, straight up. Yeah. Paul Hogan. Kim Kardashian. No, no, no. I'd like to have dinner with Justin Bieber. <laughs> what? <laughs> He's not coming to my house. No, so, um... <laughs> I'd have Bob Hawke. Dave Hughes. Barry Humphreys. Jimi Hendrix. People who have made a difference in the world, maybe Nelson Mandela at the dinner table. I don't know what he's going to say, I'm scared. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, oh. who would you choose? Probably our whole family, like a whole extended family. Mum and Dad. <sighs> Mum and Dad. Does it have to be a celebrity? Could it be family? We love it. We talk about how school is. We ask mum and dad how their day was. Family. Yeah, mum and dad. Family! Yeah. Who would you guys like to have yeah. dinner with? They just want to be with us mm. while they're eating food, which is pretty cool. They see us above everything. I'm gonna get... Yeah. Yeah. Bit, bit of a message in it for me. Yes. <laughs> what are we having for dinner? Now, I had to uh, cut the ending because it was like a beefaroni commercial. <laughs> it didn't have the punch that I was hoping for. Uh, but I'd say it this way. 
Uh, the Great Commission may bring you to the other side of the world, but it probably starts at the other side of your table. <laughs> Whether you have kids or not, whoever you're investing in, whatever, whatever it looks like for the gospel to be present at your table. That's honestly, that's why we're launching this resource initiative. If you want to learn more, you can go to bridge.tv slash every table on May 5th. We're asking everyone to come with their commitments ready. We're uh, building out here under roof in Spring Hill, finding a permanent location in Columbia, how we can actually better invest, not only just as a church, but in the next generation around tables. How can we train for tables better? What would it look like for us to give above and beyond, to leave a legacy for those that will come way after us? What would it look like for us to live with that kind of posture? Because at the end of the day, buildings don't change lives. Building projects don't save lives. People empowered by the Holy Spirit do. Buildings are just the tool. Tables are just the tool. But what would it look like for us to begin to think with legacy in mind? One of, one of the simple shifts that we made in our family at the start of this year was at the beginning of every day, uh, at our table, I read a, a short Bible story with my boys. And we were doing pretty well for a few weeks. And then a couple weeks ago, we had a, just a crazy morning and we like missed our alarm and everyone was running around. And I fully intended to like skip that part that morning and just kind of do breakfast at the island. And I, I tried giving my boys their cereal and my five-year-old said, no, Papa. And he pointed to the table. He said, we started the table. Like my five-year-old is already calling me out, which if you ever needed evidence that that's my kid, 100%, like... <laughs> He's already seen it though. He's like, no, we begin at the table with the word of God. That's, that's the way we do it with our family. I'm, I'm already passing that on to him. What would it look like for us to live with legacy in mind? There's a truth that I heard years ago by Andy Stanley that stuck with me. He said, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. And maybe it's not raise, maybe it's apprentice or disciple or teach or spend time with or mentor, the next generation is far more likely to follow our example than our advice. And you've heard me say it before, I don't think the next generation is the future of the church. I think they're the church right now. Right now. What if we began to take that seriously with our lives? And we want to help facilitate that, to bring the gospel to every table and help them to do the same. If you were with us last week, I had everyone take out their phones and set an alarm for 505. If you haven't done that yet, 505 May 5th is Commitment Sunday. I would love for all of us to set our alarms so that each day, 505 a.m. or p.m., depending on how ambitious you are, to pray together as a community for Commitment Sunday, to, to expand so that the gospel can go forward in every domain of our lives. What would it look like for us to create space for God's presence? To think not just about me and my kingdom and what I'm doing today, but who am I investing in? Who am I pouring myself out for? Who are you investing in to carry a legacy forward? What kind of mark are we leaving? There's a, a Greek proverb that I read years ago that I think encapsulates this well. It says, a society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they know they shall never sit. Bridge Church, I wanna say this. I want for us to live for days that we'll never actually see. That's what I think living for a legacy means. To live for days, to sacrifice for days, to invest and pour out for days that we, we this side of eternity we might not ever see. I'll say it again. Don't live to be a legend. Live to leave a legacy. A legacy of faithfulness, of service, of sacrifice. To me, that's way more valuable than any knickknack or old beat-up symbol. And maybe at this point you're wondering about that church in Ephesus. Did they actually heed Paul's words? Some five or more years later, Paul actually wrote a church wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus. It's the letter that we now know as Ephesians. And he encouraged them to exhibit unity, to cling to grace rather than works, to bear spiritual fruit, to beware of false teachers, to serve one another, and to be ready for a spiritual battle. In short, it seemed like they were doing pretty well. And then perhaps a generation later, the church of Ephesus is mentioned again, this time in the book of Revelation. It's one of the seven churches of Asia addressed in chapters 2 and 3. And we read in chapter 2 how the church in Ephesus was commended 
for all the good work that they were doing, their toil, their effort, their energy, it would read like, hey, Bridge Church, you're doing good work. Way to go. And then pretty famously, though, there's this one line that I've never been able to shake. He says, but I do hold this one thing against you. You've left your first love. My, my prayer is that we would never do good things for God apart from God. That God wouldn't look at us and say, I mean, I, I see all the hard work. I see the discipline. I see your investment. I see this resource initiative that you launched and the buildings that you built and the ministries that you developed. That's, those are all good things. Do not lose your first love. That is where legacy begins. The Apostle Paul left a legacy of service just as Jesus had left a legacy of service. In fact, the Howertons and the Schutmans left us a legacy of service. We are standing on the shoulders of 20 years of a posture of pouring ourselves out, not for our sake, but for the sake of others. May the same God and the same spirit that compelled Paul be also at work in our own lives, compelling every step, every conversation, at every table. May it be said of us. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of today, of this community, this family. God, would you help us to be a people who are not simply advised by your spirit, but compelled by? Would you order our thoughts and our actions, God? Help us to live a life not simply aimed at ourselves, what we will accomplish, what we will be known for, but a life poured out, God, not for our sake, but for the sake of the world. Help us to live with that open-handed posture, to step into what it is that you have for us, God. We thank you and we love you. And we pray all of these things in the beautiful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. We're going to celebrate communion together now, something we call the table of Jesus. And we remember that this last supper with his disciples, Jesus took bread and juice, like these very, this, the bread and the cup were familiar objects, but he did something really unique with them. And when he broke bread and took the cup. He said, this is my body and my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible mentions a lot about remembering. He's like, you're prone to forget. You're prone to sort of this spiritual amnesia. When you gather, do this again to remember. It's not just about life, death, resurrection, although that's a really big part of it. It's about joining him in the work of proclaiming the good news of the gospel with our entire lives, not just one day a week, but with everything that we have. So in a moment when the trays are passed, I'd encourage you to take, take both the cups, they're stacked on each other, and hold on to the bread and the juice. We're gonna sing and celebrate together and then we'll receive together in just a couple of minutes. Let's all stand together as we sing. I'm sorry, and I 
represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us. So let's receive the bread together. And the cup represents the blood that was shed for our forgiveness. Let's receive the cup together. today. If you want prayer, our prayer team is available down front. As we go, may we bring the gospel to every table. We'll see you next week. Well, Bridge family, we're so glad that you've tuned in today. 
And I just wanna encourage you, if you sense God stirring anything in your heart during our time together, please go ahead and take a next step. We believe that every single person has a next step and we would be so honored to walk alongside you as you take yours today. So I wanna encourage you to fill out our online connect card where you can let us know your information, let us know what God is doing in your life and if there's any way that our prayer team can be praying for you this week. Yeah, I love how technology is able to bring us together. But we wanna say also, if you're ever in the Middle Tennessee area, we would love to invite you to join us in person. We know that community in a local church setting is so important. And even if you're not in the Middle Tennessee area, we would love to get you connected with a local church that is close to you so that you can continue your journey of being with Jesus and becoming like him all within the context of community. Yeah. And last but not least, we know that the mission of the bridge is fueled by your generosity and it helps us be able to reach our cities, the nation, and even around the globe. Yeah, giving is a part of our worship to God. It is an opportunity for us to honor Him with what He has already given to us, whether you can give a lot or a little. So if you would like to participate in giving today, there are several ways that you can do that. And if you've already given, I wanna say thank you. We have such an incredibly generous church family and it is an honor and a privilege to be on mission together. I wanna say is one last time, at least for today, church family, we love you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We know God loves you so much more. Go be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. And we'll see you next week. See you next week.